from the beginning, art was was not even a choice. It just happened to me, and it was my tool to process everything. It was the tool I found to process reality, to process my concerns, my my dreams. So besides art, the first thing that saved me really was love. Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another inspiring Dear Family podcast interview. I hope that you're doing as best as can be expected and that you're not only protecting your physical health, you're also looking out for your mental health. I'm really excited to share my next guest with you. Her name is Elsa Mora, and she is an artist like no other. We first spoke beginning of March before we were sheltering at home. And honestly, it feels like the world has been turned upside down since then. But what has remained the same is her an incredible message, which I can't wait for you to hear. Thank you so much for listening on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you aren't already doing so, please subscribe and share. And remember, those five-star reviews, they really do help me grow. So thank you so much. Take care of yourself and enjoy. Elsa Mora is an artist and curator born and raised in Cuba. In her culture, mental illness is not a secret and she would know because she grew up surrounded by family members who had bipolar, depression, schizophrenia, autism, and alcoholism. Elsa moved to Los Angeles to pursue her art in 2001 and then to upstate New York with her husband and two children in 2014. She continues to make art, now focusing on unique paper sculptures while also also curating the Art Yard, an alternative contemporary art gallery, theater, and residency program. Elsa's art has been exhibited worldwide in art galleries and museums. She's taught at the Vocational School of Arts in Cuba and has been a visiting artist at the Art Institute of Chicago, San Francisco State University, the Art Institute of Boston, the MoMA Design Store, and the National Gallery of Art, among others. Her work is in the permanent collection of the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C., and the Long Beach Museum of Art in California. As an illustrator, she's collaborated with the Museum of Art, the New York Review of Books, Oprah Magazine, Cosmopolitan, and more. She's passionate about forming and strengthening communities through the transformational power of art, creativity, and collaboration. Elsa's beloved son, Diego, was diagnosed as autistic when he was just two years old. When her son turned 14, he experienced psychosis and was hospitalized. Elsa believes her intuition is serving her family well because she's been dealing with mentally ill family members her whole life. It's why she's so open and willing to share about her family struggles so others can get over their discomfort and rid themselves of their own shame and secrets. Growing up poor in Cuba taught Elsa that the most precious possession we have is our mind and that creativity and imagination can solve any problem, whether material or emotional. Elsa's complex, delicate, and fascinating paper sculptures are a metaphor for the mind, and hers is full of creativity, beautiful design, and profound thoughts. I'm so thrilled to welcome Elsa today. Hi, Elsa. Hi, Rachel. Hi. And we're speaking across the country. Are you at your home in Woodstock? Yes, I'm up here in upstate New York. Very cool. Uh, We have never met personally, but a mutual friend of ours, her name is Allison Grimmett. She mentioned that I had to have you as a guest. So I went home and I Googled you and I absolutely fell in love with your artwork. And then when we spoke and you told me about your family and um, your upbringing and what you're dealing with your family now, I knew you had a story that needed to be shared. And we're going to get to that soon, but I just wanted wanted to share a little story about my oldest daughter, Amber. And when she was five years old, she used to make these beautiful 3D sculptures with paper and marker, and she would use tape 
to make them, you know, come to life. And it still is something that delights my husband and I because we've held on to those treasures. And so when I looked at your artwork, now granted, it was much more complex. I, I, found, I saw that kind of childlike wonder and it just made me so happy. But it's also, again, like I said, very complex and beautiful. So we're going to talk about your artwork in a minute. But because this is a podcast called Dear Family, I always like to start with my guests telling us a little bit about your family and what it was like growing up in Cuba. So I I grew up in a family where we were uh, eight children, four from my mom and dad, and the rest uh, from my dad and two different wives. That is one of them that I don't know, but I know everybody else. I'm closest to my uh, my brother Alex, who is a year younger than me. My family was very interesting when I was growing up. They are, I would say they're good people who had to struggle a lot with a lot of things, especially mental illness and then some element of poverty. They were hardworking, very uh, loving in their own way, and very complicated. So I was a little girl growing up in this environment. And as a result of all these um, complications that we had as a family, I basically became extremely curious about people. I, I, all I wanted to do was to understand them and why they were the way they were. So I became extremely curious about that. And very early on, I found art as a way to process all these questions that I had. And that's more or less how I grew up. That was my environment. And you had mentioned, because we spoke before, that there was bipolar and schizophrenia and alcoholism and depression all around you. Were these labeled? Like, did, did your family members know? that they had mental health issues? Well, the main one that we did name all the time because we had a very clear diagnosis was my sister. Uh, she suffered from schizophrenia. She was diagnosed uh, pretty early on. She was around 15, 16. So that was the main uh, illness that we had in the family. Everything else, we didn't have names at the time. I knew about alcohol abuse from watching uh, what was going on <clears throat> with two of my, uh, of my brothers. I knew that mom and dad had their own thing, but we just didn't have a name at the time. That came out to be clear in my mind a lot later when I was an adult. And you had mentioned that in your culture, mental illness is not a secret, whereas like in America, we often felt a lot of shame about it. Why, why do you think it was not, not a secret? Well, I would say that part of the reason might be that the Cuban population is uh, educated in these issues. Um, that was something that we talked about in school. And in the neighborhood, it was something pretty normal. And in my case in particular, uh, it was something that was nor a normal part of life. And when I came here, I did notice that big difference, that that was taboo for many families. Like, uh, And I learned about that, especially when I got my son's diagnosis when he was two years old. And I started meeting with people that I felt were not very comfortable talking about their own uh, child's diagnosis. So very gradually, I learned that many people were, I don't know exactly if they were exactly embarrassed or more like afraid of what other people would think about their children and how that would limit uh, their lives. So I'm still trying to figure out what that comes from. But I definitely feel that here, um, not everyone, I know a lot of people that are very open, but as a culture, it's something really bad. You know, like if someone, let's say at a uh, workplace, they say, okay, hello, my name is blah, blah, blah. And by the way, I suffer from mental illness. It's like that person is not going to feel uh, very comfortable. 
right? Um, it's it's like kind of stigma. They they put stigma on people and labels and shame and and I I really like that you are coming from a place where you were surrounded by it, but you never felt ashamed of it. And now you're educating others. Can you tell us a little bit about Diego? So our son, Diego, who is 14 now, he was diagnosed with autism when he, when he was two, two years old. Uh, my husband and I at the time were not educated enough on this neurological condition. So we didn't really know that this was the case. I noticed some things anyway that Diego's language was a little not at the level that I thought it should be, but the pediatrician said boys tend to be a little bit slower. So we thought, okay, well, let's keep an eye on that. But it was the day when we took him to the first daycare with many other kids his same age that we noticed something is really different with him. He wasn't able to say words like the other kids. He couldn't follow directions. He actually ran away and uh, was hiding in this tiny little room. He couldn't stand all the noise. And I, I felt that something is not right. Something is going on. So we left him there. And I actually, instead of leaving, I went to the parking lot because I had the this feeling that they were going to call me back. So I stayed there instead of going home. And only two hours later, I stayed there for two hours. They called me and I was ready. I said, I just knew it. So I went to the principal's office and she said, "Uh, I have a lot of experience with children. She was very gentle in saying this. So uh, sometimes use force from spending a little time with them. I can see if they need some extra help. So would you consider um, taking Diego for an evaluation? And I said, of course. So next day, actually the same day, we just called someone that my husband happened to know uh, that worked with with children. She was a a doctor, a therapist. And then we arranged for a meeting with her. She evaluated him. She had a clinic with her, her husband. And she actually had a lot of experience with autism. She founded some organization in the past. So she was able to give us a diagnosis um, like two days later. She needed to process everything with her husband. And then we took it from there. We In Los Angeles, there is a system where you have to connect with something called the regional center. And they offer a lot of services. So we went immediately into early intervention and Diego had a huge amount of therapy every single day from very early until the afternoon uh, speech therapy OT therapy uh, social skills therapy and so on uh, until we moved here so he had a lot of therapy in LA and we did start to see progress uh, gradually so that was very good for him so thank goodness you were not in denial and the moment somebody said you should seek resources you did and um now you're living in upstate new york with your husband and you have a a daughter um and can you tell us what happened when diego turned 14 yes uh well diego has a, a sister uh natalie and a brother he's in his 20s and lives in los angeles and he's my stepson, so uh, he has two siblings, and they are amazing. So when he was 14, that's the age when children with autism in general become really aware of their condition. So that was extremely hard for him. He, We had always been super open about it. Uh, he was actually proud of it. Sometimes he said, I'm proud. I like being Diego. But then when puberty arrived, we could see that he started changing. He became a little bit less confident or a little bit less proud. And he started to notice how he was a little bit behind in school. He was working really, really, really hard because uh, in general, that's the way he grew up. He had to work really hard to get to 
the point of having language or walking, even writing. So he worked so hard to try to catch up with the other kids. But no matter what he did, it was just very hard for him to, to be at the same level. And that started to create a little bit of anxiety. And he was extremely frustrated. And all of this gradually took him to a high level of stress. And all of that ended up creating um, psychosis in his brain, Mm. which doctors explained, uh, or at the time they told us, sometimes to make it easy to understand, it's like the brain is under so much stress and anxiety that the brain has to unplug all the wires and say, okay, I, I cannot deal with reality right now. So I'm going to disconnect. And the person becomes really disconnected from reality. So that's the point that he reached at that time. So we had to take him to the hospital and he stayed there for, for two weeks with uh, treatment to get him out of uh, psychosis. So that, that was extremely difficult for us as a family to watch and difficult for him because it shaped his life everything changed and after that he couldn't go back to school because he's still in the process of recovering so he has been home he has a little bit of home instruction every day Uh, he can't really focus for too long so that's almost like symbolic he has a little bit of speech therapy because his language became really uh, affected by this and that is the process we're going through there are some developments lately we uh, after spending some time doing the treatment he's doing we realized that there has to be something else and this is totally new i didn't tell you this before this just came up in the last few days So we saw a different doctor that has a lot of experience with children like Diego. And he very recently diagnosed him with something called catatonia. Uh, This is a very rare thing. It's only like 10% of people affected with mental illness. And we are feeling pretty confident that this is um, the, the right diagnosis. And this is on top of autism. And actually, catatonia is not an illness. It's a symptom of something else. So that is what is affecting his language so dramatically now. And just his whole life, you know, he's not able to uh, do all the things he did before. He can draw a little bit, but not the way he did before, which was dramatically uh, advanced, you know, what he was able to do. So right now, he's functioning uh, uh i would say i don't know uh, like 60 percent of his capacity i would say or his brain power went down to um, a very scary level so we are right now in the process of figuring out this new um stage you know how we're going to treat him uh, so that's where he's at uh, right now well i have such compassion for you and your husband and Diego and Diego's siblings. It's very hard to see someone you love go through something like this. And is catatonia, I mean, I don't, I, I, it makes me associate with the word catatonic, which is, you know, exact, Mm -hmm. as you said, it's like a state of being. So um, is there a, like, do they medicate it? Is what form of therapy would that would they suggest? Yeah, uh, this is highly treatable. Oh, and that's good. good. Yeah, it's the good news right now, and we're super excited about that. Uh, yes, they treat it with uh, drugs. It's uh-huh. a limited limited uh, amount of time under this drug, and um, then that's the, the the first approach. And then if that doesn't work which hopefully that won't be Diego's case, then there is um, electroshock therapy, which I know is extremely scary. I have a lot of experience from seeing my sister go through that. Um, 
but they say that it's highly effective because it resets the brain. So these are the two ways, you know. The yeah, electric- you know, um, Andy Berman was one of my guests, and he had electric shock therapy or electric convulsive therapy, and it completely saved him. So, you know, I, I, I'm happy for Diego that he has parents that are so willing to help him with this process because I can only imagine how scary it is for him. And it's, it's a very fascinating thing. And we're going to talk about your paper art sculptures and how you, you see it, paper are similar to the mind. But I think it's really interesting that, you know, Diego, who has autism and was you had mentioned had been bullied and turned to superheroes and then he got older and felt kind of this lack of self-esteem about himself and the stress and anxiety how that can push your brain into a point of like where you have to protect it you know like he he ended up going into psychotic thoughts in a way maybe to for his own way of pulling back from the reality it's so interesting, really. And I, I know that you are very open about this, which, of course, I so appreciate because I think you believe that it's helpful to educate others. And do you think that this comes from, like, where does this come from, your willingness and openness to discuss this? I guess it comes from the way I grew up where uh, mental illness was so organically integrated in my life I never saw it as something foreign or strange or um, it wasn't a good thing for sure. And it wasn't easy for sure. And I wasn't always completely fine with that. You know, as a little girl, it's really uh, stressful and scary when you know that, uh, especially my sister, wanted to die. You know, at that age, you are, that's the last thing you want to think about when you're a little kid. You know, death is a scary thing. But then gradually, as we got so familiar with hospitals and treatments and trying to just help her recover when she went to do um, electroshock therapy, it became just so normal to me that at some point I was in a way uh, desensitized, you know, if we can use that word uh, in a way that makes sense. So I became just very integrated with the whole idea that people struggled. Um, I had my own struggles at at the time. They were not connected to mental illness, but it was connected to the fact that I needed a way to find myself in the middle of all these things that were going on with my relatives. You know, it's really a challenge when you have very close relatives suffering and, and you suffer by watching them, it, it's hard. So it, the fact that I had to find myself, you know, and find a space for me to feel safe, that just, I would say, gave me some tools where I feel pretty comfortable around any anybody who suffers, not only from mental illness, but from whatever reason, you know, it, it give them uh, uh, suffering. So that's, uh, now helping me a lot with Diego because it doesn't feel in my experience as something um, foreign or extremely dangerous. It's just what it is. You know, I think that everybody struggles no matter uh, what the reason is. Some of the people that struggle, uh, the reason is mental illness. Some other people have other reasons. But in general, I think that humans are wired in a way that it's just impossible to, to, to avoid suffering. And I just became so comfortable with suffering. I was telling a friend the other day that when you live long enough with a problem, you become friends with that problem. So it's not a stranger anymore. <laughs> it's like, wow, I, I recognize you. You know, you're my friend. You've been here with me since I, since I was very little. So you don't scare me anymore because I I have gotten to understand you so much so much that by now I I I know that it, you're just normal you know you're part of life so that's the way I feel when it comes to all these issues of mental illness and suffering and struggling 
you know, it's very familiar to me and I'm not scared of it. Um, That's really I'm, amazing. You know, it's like your, your acceptance of it is allowing you to kind of let go of the fear. And mm -hmm. it's, it's so important because right, rather than making enemies with your problems, you're, you're almost like cozying up to it so that you can deal with it. And, and I think that that's really amazing. And when, when we spoke, you mentioned something up along these lines about all the different trees on your land mm -hmm. and how you compare them to nature and I mean, humans. And do you remember what you said? Oh, yeah. I'm looking through the window right now <laughs> and I'm seeing those trees that I was talking about. We have this area behind our house with a lot of trees. And I just, sometimes I go for a walk when I need to calm down and find clarity about things. And then looking at those trees give me so much comfort because they look just like people. Um, meaning like whatever happens with trees is very similar to what happens to humans. So for example, I'm seeing a couple of them that are really robust, you know, big trunk, super tall, very strong. You know, those are the ones that, are I would say like the main characters in this whole backyard but then there are some that are super skinny and they move very easily with the wind um, some of them are uh, broken and they are falling on each other and then you feel like some of them have been I mean I observed that some of them have been in that situation for years so they don't fall down all the way to the ground they just stay on top of another one um, and then, so whatever situation are um, visible with these trees make me think about uh, issues with humans. You know, they're very similar. So just by looking at that, I feel comfort because trees don't care about that. You know, if one tree falls, the other one stays nice and calm. You know, they don't freak out. They don't scream. I really they, love that. I love that. And I love how you look at it. It's, you know, it is a very kind of like open-minded way of looking at it. And, and as we know, nature is seriously some of the best medicine. Okay. I'm going to switch gears here, Elsa, and ask you to tell us about your birth date changing when you were just 16 and how it did something interesting to your brain and why it made you realize that you could be whoever you wanted to be, like Marie Antoinette and Frida Kahlo. Yeah, that's a funny story that happened. Uh, that's a true story. I was born on May 9th, but I didn't know that until I was 16. Because before that, the date that I had in my brain, because that's what everybody told me, was May 8th. You so saw the day before my real birth date. And then <clears throat> I found out about this when I went to issue, to issue my uh, ID, my first ID. In Cuba, you're an adult when you're 16. So I went to uh, <clears throat> get my ID issued, and the lady asked me for my birth date. And when I say May 9th, she said, well, I can't find your information here. She asked me, are you sure that it's May 8th? And I said, of course, you know, that's my birthday. So anyway, the short story is that she found out that the paper said it was the next day, May 9th. And I said, well, there has to be a mistake here. And she said, well, that's what we have. You know, that's the way they register you. I went back home. I told my mom and she said, oh, those people always making mistakes. You know, that's a mistake. You were born. I remember exactly because that was Mother's Day on May 8th. And then I went to my dad and I told him the story. And then finally he said, well, listen, don't you tell your mom. I'm going to tell you the truth. You were born on May 9th, but she was obsessed with the idea of saying my daughter was born on Mother's Day. So she decided to change the facts in her brain. And then she asked me to register you on that day. But when I went to the place, I didn't want to do that. So I said, you know, the right date, which is May 9th. Uh, but to this day, my mom denies the whole thing. <laughs> she said, it's not true. And my dad has confirmed and other people that it is true. So at that time, I was 16. So that's a pretty interesting age because that's when almost the foundational beliefs of your life 
become stronger. You're a teenager, you're very strong, opinionated. And that gave me a little bit of permission. I felt like, wow. So actually, I don't have to believe anything. You know, I can actually change things around and make it work for me the way my mom did. You know, if she wanted me to be born on Mother's Day, and to this day, that's, she made up her mind that that was the reality, then fine. You know, I, I don't care about that. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Uh, so it's just, you know, in that funny way, it gave me uh, this way of looking at life that nothing has to be exactly so rigid, uh, especially me grew, growing up with all these um, limitations in a way that made life a little bit hard. Uh, I didn't have to label myself in any way, not poor, not um, in any way. So I became, in my own brain, free to be whatever I wanted to be, and <clears throat> to do whatever I thought it was the right thing for me to do. Um, and that has been um, basically my philosophy in life. Like, you just create your own set of beliefs and you go with them um, um, you defend, you know, what you believe and and most of the times it works nicely. I love that, Elsa. It's like it was maybe divine intervention for you at a time because when you were 16 was also when you ended up leaving home. Um, without going into too much detail because your whole life is so fascinating, but how did you end up in America? Yes. Well, before I came to live here, I was just lucky to have a wonderful friend who was a lawyer. She very unfortunately, she died uh, years ago, but she became my mentor in Cuba. She, we met when I was only in my early 20s. So we became very good friends and she became my mentor. She was the person who uh, for some reason, she thought, I want to help you. And she connected me with different people in America through my art. <clears throat> and that's how, at some point, she found a gallery for me in Chicago and New York City. It was the same gallery that had two spaces. And through that relationship, I got an invitation to come. And I came different times for everything connected, every trip was connected to my art. But then later on, after many years of living in Cuba, I already had my own apartment. I had a career um, uh, established in the island. I met this man through my friend. I had a good friend who I met during one of these uh, trips to, to Chicago. And she had a brother and she basically introduced uh, the two of us in Havana. And um, that's how I met him. We fell in love. It's a long story, it's more than that, but that's how I ended up <clears throat> living here permanently in 2001. Wow, wow. And so, but I mean, your talent brought you to where you were, right? I mean, clearly, if galleries are coming across to look at your work in Cuba, and then wanting you to show your work, you, you clearly have a lot of talent. And um, on one side, you're an artist, and you do work around your own issues. But the other side is that you're a curator. And you do exhibitions at museums, and you co-founded the Art Yard, which works with community. Can you tell us a little bit about being the artistic director and curator at the Art Center? Yes, well, I've been extremely lucky to be friends with an amazing person, actually two people, uh, Jill Carney and Stephen McDonald. They are my friends. And I met them through my husband because Jill went to school with my husband when, when she was very young, when they were young. Uh, so they founded this center in 2016. And Jill invited me to come and work with them. And that's how I ended up there. I always had the uh, need to not be just an artist doing my own art. There is a part of me that 
somehow has this uh, need to connect with other people and spend time around other people and get inspired by them and help them if I can. So all of this came together with working with Jill at Art Yard. Um, and are you in the process of building a new location? Is that what I'm seeing on Instagram? Oh, yes. There is a new building that is in the process of um, being built that will be ready sometime this year. It's a gift, you know, for the community and a statement about the importance of art because behind our yard, the whole idea is the, the transformational power of art and community and creativity and collaboration. So the idea is for this place to become a home for all of that. And I'm extremely lucky to be part of this uh, venture, an arts organization like Art Yard. I have never seen one like that. Um, I'm thrilled, you know, with the work that uh, we do there. And I, I cannot wait uh, to see the stuff we're going to continue to do after the building is finished. And Art Yard is in French Town, New Jersey. That's right. Right. So Elsa, you said that paper is a metaphor for the mind and that blank paper, blank mind, um, but paper can also be very flexible and transform into anything. And, that, and you've also said that there's a fascinating side and a devastating side of mental illness. Did you do a series about mental illness? Was this the 101 series? Yes. In 2018, I started working on this series of 101 uh, small paper sculptures. And each one represents a mental uh, disorder. I, I have been always fascinated with uh, mental illness. I mean, that seems... Strange to say, but once you go into studying the different ways in which the brain can dysfunction or function, is absolutely fascinating. So I became very curious about studying um, unusual mental illnesses or disorders, and I came up with a list of 101 that I wanted to represent in these uh, paper sculptures. So it took some time because that's a very slow work, but that's what I did. I created this work gradually over the course of two years, and it went to a show that I uh, exhibited first at um, the uh, Jordan Schnitzer Museum in Eugene, Oregon, and then that same show is right now <clears throat> at our yard in Frenchtown, New Jersey. Yes, and talking about paper and the mind, um, did I tell you how I started working with paper? Because that explains the whole thing. Oh, no, I'd love to hear that. Yes, uh, when Diego was first diagnosed with autism and we started taking him to therapy, most of the time I was a person taking him because Bill was uh, at work or traveling. So during those years, I was devoted to uh, working with Diego and my daughter, Natalie. So every time I went to therapy, I had some time, sometimes two hours, sometimes an hour. And I brought a piece of paper one day and I said, okay, well, I'm, I wait here. I want to do something with my hands. So I started to play around with this piece of paper. And I thought, well, this is interesting because I could take it a little bit more seriously and bring uh, different types of paper I, and then <clears throat> some tools, maybe some scissors. So while Diego was working in the room with a therapist and I, I, I could hear the progress gradually, I was working on the other side with paper. So it became a really interesting process where I saw Diego have progress on his side, but I also see me have progress working with this paper. Like the more I studied paper, the more I manipulated it, the more I worked with it the more it showed me that he could do. And it was the same thing with Diego. You know, the more therapy he received, the more uh, we went there, the more I could see language coming out uh, from him. And uh, he was starting to look me in the eye. So it was a very organic process. That's how at some point I said, well, you know, I'm going to take this very seriously. I'm going to see 
what else I can do with paper beyond just sitting here and playing a, a little bit with uh, these little pieces. So I eventually I took it to my studio. I got a couple of books, very basic books about working with paper. And then from there on, I started a, a long journey of exploring this very unassuming and simple material that had so much potential, as much as my son Diego, that I didn't know at the time. Because like everything, the more you put energy into working with something, the more you learn about that something and the more um, that something can teach you things that you had no idea you could learn from it. So that's how I started uh, to see paper as almost as the trees that I'm talking about behind my house. Um, something that when you stop a little bit and pay attention and observe, uh, you get answers about things. So that's what paper became uh, as a material for me. And what kind of art were you doing before that? My work before I started working with paper was really diverse. I work in different media, photography, painting, drawing, uh, sculpture. It depends. Uh, it depends on the subject. I basically work mostly based on a subject and then whatever material I thought was appropriate for the subject, I went into that material. So throughout my career, before I found paper, I was playing around with different uh, media. So I wasn't focused on just one. And you uh, went to art school in, in Cuba. Yeah. Yes. yes, I went to art school and then I graduated in uh, sculpture. That was my main area. Um, then I was a teacher for a couple of years. Uh, I worked for an arts, art center for a year. And then at some point, I decided I really want to do this full time. And I became a full time artist uh, in Cuba. Well, so that leads me to the next question, um, which is, you know, the idea of the starving artist and how does one support themselves as an artist. But you talk about how it's such a gift to work with your hands. Can you tell us about that gift? In my case, to be totally honest, even though I went to art school, but I never saw art exactly as, um, how can I say, as a business that started later on when I became more of an adult. But from the beginning, art was, was not even a choice. It just happened to me, and it was my tool to process everything. It was the tool I found to process reality, to process my concerns, my, my dreams. Uh, and even though, how can I, like now I do a lot of concrete things, in the beginning, it was mostly in my head. And I always say that, uh, in my case, at least, I can only talk for me, a lot of the creative process is invisible. You don't see it. And sometimes it comes out in the work. Sometimes it, it's, it stays in your head. So a lot of the creative process to me, of course, uh, in my head, uh, when I'm driving, when I'm cleaning the house, when I'm doing something else that has nothing to do with art. So that's how I... I uh, started um, working with art, you know, in a very organic way, connected to whatever uh, was going on at the time. And then later on, when I felt very uh, comfortable in that world where almost everything happened in my head, then I got very interested in materials. I, I really wanted to explore every possible material from wood to clay and ceramics, um, fabric, paper. Uh, anything that I could get in my hands, I became just so curious about how I could, um, how can I say, like conquer this material. You know, it's like uh, when you get a power tool in the beginning and you're a little afraid to, to use it because it's so intimidating. Um, you know, I felt that attraction to materials in the beginning. I was a little bit like, well, I have no idea what to do with this. But once I went into studying it, the same way I did with paper, I felt very comfortable. And then at some point, I didn't have to think too much. So the work came out uh, pretty spontaneously uh, in most cases. So that I would say that's the process that I, I followed in my experience. 
I love that. And I mean, you clearly had the curiosity within you and growing up in a, where you did, you know, uh, in a location that we were, your parents weren't, didn't have a lot of education. This was something that, that you were able to throw yourself into and constantly learn and, and continue to grow, which is so good for anyone's development, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so Elsa, you have said that every day is a new adventure and a new opportunity to do something meaningful. And, you know, I, I really appreciate how you mentioned how you came, you know, from a poor background and it was your mind that was your best asset. And you were, you were able to always find positive in the negative, can you explain explain that to us? How do you f- always find positive in the negative, even when you're dealing with, for example, family members that are are that you love and 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 are suffering? How do you find positive? Yeah, well, I I think a lot about that sometimes. I like to go back into my life and think where the positivism came from and the creativity. And, you know, as much as I would like to take credit for everything, (laughs) which humans tend to do, to be totally honest, it's all about the influences that you have in your life. So I would say starting with my sister, Ileana, who has uh, schizophrenia, uh, she was one of the most talented people that I remember when I was growing up. She, She introduced me to poetry and reading and art. Uh, so that was the beginning of this way of looking at, at, at things in a creative way. There is my mom who never had a, a formal education, but she was so naturally smart and so aware of the importance of education and developing your brain and using your whatever talents you had. So she was very good at uh, constantly reminding all of her children, you know, use your brain. That, you know, you might be poor, but your brain is rich. You know, you have so much potential that you can use. So that was a big influence. Uh, then I have this teacher, uh, Margarita was her name. She's just an older woman, uh, very skinny. I remember her with so much um, love. Uh, she did something remarkable one day. You know, she noticed that I, we didn't have any anything. We didn't have any money. So therefore, I didn't have our supplies. And one day she came with these bags of colored pencils and they were 12. I remember perfectly well. And I I couldn't believe it. So she gave it to me as a gift. And I mean, just picture that in Cuba having even a a notebook, you know, it's like a treasure, you know, at the time um, we were super poor. And she gave me these bags. I was in fourth grade and she made me feel so good about myself, you know, so, and she said, you have talent, you know, go ahead and use a talent. And here are your pencils. I was afraid to use them because I didn't want to, um, you know, I didn't want them to go away uh, too fast. But she said, no, go use it. That's the whole point. So, and so on, you know, throughout my life, I was very lucky to have these uh, role models that really shaped, you know, the way I, I looked at things. And that is to this day, you know, to this day, I'm still learning from, from people. Some of them are a lot older than me. Some of them are a lot younger. But at the time when I was growing up, all these uh, positive influences created a sense of that, even though uh, sometimes I feel I felt a little neglected from the family, not because they wanted to do it intentionally, but there was just so much survival going on that you know they didn't have a lot of time to spend with me or my siblings but i did f- uh, feel this this sense of um being loved by people especially in school my teachers uh, my classmates uh, my friends so i think that that's a good formula you know if you have a little bit of nurturing uh, from wherever it comes and then you have some inclination just to be creative and also that add to that the element of mental illness in the family and watching all these people struggle and being creative 
in the way they were dealing with their uh, struggles. You know, all of these came together. And then I was super close to my brother, who is a year younger. We had a very a strong bond that made me feel I was not alone. So somehow the external circumstances in, in the middle of the uh, difficulties that we had gave me this situation where I felt uh, that I, I, I could give myself permission to dream and to be free, you know, in my brain, in my mind. And that's how I started to feel very comfortable in this type of mentality where everything would be fine. Everything would be okay. You know, no matter what. I saw a lot of bad things happen before my eyes. I saw violence. I saw abuse and all of that. But that somehow didn't break me. It definitely affected me. And I, yeah, for sure, um, have to deal with whatever small or big trauma came from that in, in my own way. But but that's how everything started really becoming part of the way I look at life. You know, having love. I know it's, it sounds kind of tacky, but <laughs> love, wh whatever it comes from and in whatever shape it comes can really save you. So besides art, the first thing that saved me really was love. And then when you get that love and that uh, support from other humans, uh, in my case, I just felt I wanted to give back to them. So, and that's the beauty when people see potential in you and they say, I think you're great. I think you're talented. I think you're smart. You know, at some point you say, well, maybe they're right. And you start believing in yourself and then you want to make them proud. You know, so you think that of me, oh, I want to do something to make you so proud, you know, that you're going to um, um, be so happy that I did that. So that's how uh, I did when I was younger. And that's what I try to do now with my own children and not on, only my children, but my friends and my family. Uh, that is something I really enjoy. I One thing that I really love is finding the hidden potential in people that they might not see themselves and somehow help them see that and make them feel seen. Like, I see you. I love you. I care about you. And it's pretty magical what happens every time you you show other people that you actually really see them. Amazing. Um, so even though you celebrate your birthday now on the right day, which we now know is what, May 9th, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do you still reinvent yourself? Every day. <laughs> Every day. Okay. Great. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's something that I... I think as long as we keep that type of power, you know, to never uh, settle down too much uh, with the idea of who you are, you know, I think that's a little door, the little secret door to continuing your growth and your development. So I, I mean, every day I actually, I really honestly feel that there is still so much that I have, that I have to learn about everything. So uh, especially this last year was so uh, dramatically difficult and beautiful at the same time. So this last year and this year, I'm learning so many things and I'm changing. You know, I don't think that it's possible to go through all of these things and stay the same. So that's why I try to shed, you know, the parts of me that I better get rid of and then adopt, you know, new ways. So I'm constantly adjusting to the new lessons that life throws at me. And I make sure to, to stay absolutely open-minded about myself, not take myself too seriously, not think that I have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. I might have one or two, everything else I have to figure out as I go. Uh, so yeah, definitely. I invent my, myself every single day. I reinvent and I'm myself. sure it's going to come through in your artwork at some point. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, okay. So this is a question I ask all my guests. If you could write your younger 20 year old self. So when you were 20, you were still in Cuba, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you could write your younger 20 year old self, a dear Elsa love letter. Knowing what you know now, what would you tell your younger self? I would tell my younger self, make sure that you continue to be exactly who you are. 
and trust yourself that things will be fine just because of that, because you're a good person, you're caring, and everything will be fine, no matter what. Do you have any happiness habits? Is there anything that you do that brings you happiness and grounds you? Well, from the time I wake up in the morning, sometimes I laugh at myself because <laughs> I, have this, I have this mindset like something wonderful is about to happen. Uh, it's, it's hard to explain. I, I don't ask myself to do it. It's a natural thing. I guess it's a survival thing that I learned in the past that no matter, because things got so bad at some point, whatever tiny little thing happened that was good, it became huge. So I still kind of inflate whatever good things happen. So um, I would say that's one of my little secrets. It's like whatever happens that is good, enjoy it as much as you can and really celebrate, celebrate right? Yeah. Celebrate it. Mm -hmm, exactly. So it's celebrating whatever good things happen through your day. Uh, I do laugh a lot, you know, <laughs> even though I might sound a little serious here, but I, I'm not very serious. I'm always joking with my children, coming up with uh, funny things, um, especially with my daughter. She ha has a great sense of humor, but also my husband. We're, uh, we're a, family, a funny family. Yeah, humor is super important. You know, it's not taking things too seriously. And then the rest is stay curious and open and uh, just patiently waiting for whatever comes next. Yeah, and you you strike me as somebody that is just so optimistic, which I, I consider myself to be optimistic too. And, and I think that in a lot of situations, it saves you. And I love how you said that you focus on the the small victories and, and make them big rather than focusing on the small, you know, troubles and making them bigger. So that's, yeah. that's a really wonderful way to look at life. Yeah. All right. And Elsa, where can the listeners find you now? I'll have all this in the show notes, but where can they find you? Yeah, well, I have uh, my website, elsamora.net. And then I'm in social media. I'm basically mostly on Instagram. And my name is Elsa Mora Instant. Um, other than that, go to Our Yard in Frenchtown, New Jersey. And the website is uh, www.ouryard.org. Great. Um, and everyone's going to want to visit your um, Instagram to see your beautiful artwork. It's really, it's really something. So um, I just really want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. This has been such a wonderful conversation and I wish you and your family happiness and health and, and all the best to Diego. Well, thank you so much to you and your listeners for listening to me. Of course. So, I'm going to I'm going to come try to visit the art yard. Absolutely. You should come. I will. I will. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, bye Elsa. Bye-bye. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.